Today is uh, Tuesday, June 24th, 2008. We're at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society in Buffalo, New York. And uh, we are interviewing Mr. Jim Rapp. And the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Kathleen Vogel Matthews. Uh, Mr. Rapp, for the record, would you please state your, your full name and your date and place of birth? James Matthew Rapp. I was born May 28th, 1930 in Buffalo, New York. Okay, and did you attend school in, in Buffalo? Yes. Uh, all the way through high school? Yes. And then you went on to college? I graduated from Buffalo State, just across the street. <laughs> okay, and what did you uh, get your degree in? Um, education. Okay. And I had a master's degree. Okay, and uh, when and where did you enter the service? Buffalo, New York, 16 July 1951. Okay, and you went into the Marine Corps? No, or the, the Army, Army, I'm sorry. Army. Yes, I was drafted into the Army for the Korean War. Okay, and uh, whereabouts did you go for your basic training? Uh, well, I, I might say one more thing before I answer your question. Sure. Uh, I took my physical the day that MacArthur was fired, and then I was inducted sometime later, uh, in, as I said, 16 July mm -hmm. 1951. Um, I, uh, I was received, I went to the reception area or the, or at uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and uh, then uh, uh, we went uh, to Camp Gordon. Uh, I, I took basic training at Camp Gordon, Georgia, now Fort Gordon. Okay. And how long was that basic training? It was eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Was that your first time away from home for an extended period? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about your training? Uh, what uh, what type of uh, rifle training was it? Uh, well, we uh, we were armed with uh, carbines, the M1 carbines at the time, and uh, it was uh, very hot there, very mm -hmm. mountainous, a lot of uh, red clay, sand, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I was very fortunate in my service experience. When I finished basic training, I came to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and I went to one of the longest schools in the Army. I went to the Radar Repair Corps School, 33 weeks. It was 55 weeks in peacetime, mm -hmm. and they cut it back uh, during the Korean War to 33 weeks, so I was... Um, when I finished the radar school, I had about a year in the Army, mm -hmm. because it was the 15th of July that we graduated. Uh, that was 52. And then I was fortunate again, I was uh, sent to the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project in Sandia Base, New Mexico. And uh, that was further training, further education. Was that radar oriented? Well, uh, the radar repair MOS was what they call a source MOS. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the special weapons, you can guess what they were. And that was, uh, that was an installation that had all the services represented. The Army was there, the Air Force, the Navy, and even a few Marines were at Sandy Base and they were all part of the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project. So um, we were there because uh, we had uh, electronics training and uh, we had a lot of college graduates in the, the unit. Mm -hmm. A lot of people with master's degrees and math and things like that. There was a guy who uh, was uh, concerned with tracking trajectories of weapons mm -hmm. with his 
experience in calculus, his master's degree in math, he was very good at that kind of thing. So they were all very well educated young men. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to be in that group. Okay, and how long were you there for? Well, just about a year. Okay. And then, uh, I don't know if this applied to you during Vietnam, but everybody at that time had an eight-year obligation. Mm -hmm. So I had two years of active duty and six years of reserve uh, obligation. And so I got out in uh, 53, and I didn't go into a reserve unit or a National Guard unit at the time. But um, I, I think it was 57 that they called me to go for a physical at uh, Fort Niagara. Mm -hmm. And we used to have to have a physical every four years. And uh, so I thought, well, as long as, as long as I have to go for this physical, I might as well get paid for being in the reserve. And so I joined a unit, which was the 98 Signal Company at the time, which no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Now, what uh, rank were you when you were discharged from the Army before you went into the reserve? From the active Army, I, I was a, only a POC when I got Okay. But then I became a staff sergeant reserve. Okay. And how much time did you spend in the reserves? Well, I had um, a total of uh, 13 years. I had 15 years for pay purposes, and uh, I had some bad experiences, I, uh, which caused me to leave the reserve. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, are, are you or were you familiar with the Series 10 programs? Series 10, no. Well, um, I think it went back to World War II or possibly before, but it was a way of um, getting a commission. Uh, and uh, you could do it by correspondence courses. So I took a lot of uh, correspondence courses. And they counted towards your retirement time. But ultimately, I was hoping to get a commission. And uh, when I was in the reserve, uh, one other thing I could say is I had all kinds of clearances. Mm -hmm. To be in the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, you had to have uh, not only a military uh, top secret clearance, you had to have an Atomic Energy Commission uh, Q clearance. And uh, that helped me. Uh, when I was in the 98 Signal Company, as I said, that was a part of the 98th Division, which at that time was an infantry division, reserve. And um, um, later on, they, uh, they uh, converted the 98th Division to a training division. And, um, but um, because I had all those clearances, I got into the Army Security Agency Reserve. Mm -hmm. which I, I liked very much. That was probably uh, the most uh, rewarding experience I had in the reserve. But then uh, with this, uh, with this uh, training division, I got into uh, um, a, a training, a common specialist training regiment. And uh, we went to uh, Fort Dix that year, and uh, I went to a radio operator school, an intermediate mm -hmm. speed radio operator course. And uh, then uh, finally I ended up in a, an engineer battalion, and that was my last unit in the reserve. But uh, as I said, I was trying to uh, get this commission, and. I was working with a, a civilian technician, mm -hmm. and he was looking at all the papers that I had done, and you know I got superior in every one of them. And he was saying, "Well, you're pretty close to it now. 
and uh, you, uh, you'll be getting it in the near future. This paperwork was supposed to come down. But then um, the uh, commander of the uh, battalion, 969th Engineer Battalion, uh, was a lieutenant colonel and um, a general, a brigade commander, a general came through and inspected the battalion. And somehow or other, um, this general and this colonel got into a big dispute. Mm -hmm. And of course, what was what was supposed to happen is that, uh, in order for me to get the final uh, okay on this, was this colonel was supposed to sign the papers for. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the general and the colonel got in a big argument, and the result was that the colonel was relieved. So it was a different battalion commander. He had been approving it pretty much along the line, but then he was gone and I didn't get the commission. And I thought, well, I've spent all this time in reserve and I could uh, mention the fact that we had eight children. And uh, of course, Vietnam was, this was in 66 and Vietnam was, in, uh, was going on. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I, I, uh, I put in 15 years, and uh, I uh, have these outside responsibilities aside from the, the military, and I wasn't too happy with the army mm -hmm. at the time, <laughs> so I I left, and that was the end okay. of my military service. And a lot of times I regret that. And later on, I went to. Uh, uh, Syracuse um, and I went to work for GE and I was thinking of uh, trying to get into the uh, National Guard there uh, or the Air National Guard uh, to uh, you can retire at 60 uh, but I, I couldn't get that time you mm -hmm. know so uh, that's that's the story okay um do you want to talk about, uh, I know you have an interest in, in history, and you've, uh, you've uh, done some interviewing yourself. Uh, would you care to talk about some of your experiences uh, outside of the military? Um, sure. Well, um, I did a lot of traveling uh, when I was working. I, uh, in that same year of 66, mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I had been in the Buffalo uh, Police Department as a, a radio repairman right near here in Delaware Park. And uh, I mentioned that intermediate speed radio operator course uh, school that I went to at Fort Dix. That was in 1959. And uh, I had been uh, working for my father after I came out of the military, and um, I, I had all these responsibilities, and I was looking for a floor under my uh, income. So I took that, uh, that uh, civil service job uh, for the police radio system, and I was number one on the, the uh, civil service list, and I was appointed to it. So, I worked at the uh, police radio station for four years from 62 to 66. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work for Motorola Consumer Products uh, Division of Motorola Incorporated. And um, I worked there, um, well, uh, it changed from being Motorola. And uh, I think maybe that was, 72, yeah, I think so. Um, there was a lot of talk, there were a lot of rumors flying around Motorola that they were going to sell that division of the company. And uh, they were talking about uh, Magnavox and uh, I don't know, other companies in that same business. Well, ultimately, 
they sold uh, the consumer products division, just that division. Now, mm -hmm. you know, because Motorola went on and was very successful and is very successful today. And um, they uh, sold that uh, division to Mashusta Electric Industrial Company of Japan. And uh, they renamed, they have been calling our color TV sets quasars. And what happened was when Mashusta took it over, uh, they called it quasar electronics. And it existed, they were building those sets for a while. And I've been in some television dealers show rooms and I don't see that name any longer. It's, mm -hmm. it's gone. And they're primarily in the cell phone business and that kind of thing. Um, but then, um, in the, they were laying a lot of people off. And uh, I was a survivor for a long time. And finally, it was December of uh, 1974 that I finally was one of those people who were laid off. And then I went into teaching, because I had gone to college before, but I hadn't finished at that time, so I went back to Buffalo State. Mm -hmm. And I got a degree in education, and I had I taught electronics when I was with Motorola. So I, I taught for uh, six years, and then I went back I went back into private industry. I went to work for GE, mm -hmm. and that was my last uh, full-time employment. Then I worked uh, originally uh, in what was called the uh, PDPO, which was the Projection Display Products Operation, and we built. Uh, video projectors that could put up pictures that uh, you might see on a movie screen, that big a picture. But that wasn't always the case. It was just, you could adjust the size of the picture by moving the projector back and forth and mm -hmm. focusing. And uh, those, uh, those projectors, uh, when I came there, they were about $100,000 each, 150000 And they went up beyond that because they put in, this projector used a, a single light valve. The original black and white projector used a single light valve, which was a different device for display, not a CRT. And then later on, they, uh, they uh, developed a three light valve projector, which was color, and that was like $350,000. So I, uh, I was uh, teaching people about the theory and operation of those projectors and the maintenance of those projectors. And I wrote manuals. I, uh, I didn't have the title of engineering writer then, but I was writing uh, um, service and maintenance and theory manuals. Um, and then um, I liked to do the writing. And I, uh, went over to Sonar. I went to Undersea Systems Department at GE. And I was an engineering writer there, and that was uh, a good job. I liked that. And uh, through the writing, I, I got to be a part of the uh, in-house uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was working as a journalist there for a while. Um, and then, I don't know if you're familiar with this at all, but uh, Jack Welch was the head of GE at the time, mm -hmm. and he just decided to abolish the, the uh, aerospace division. And we were part of that aerospace division, so it just disappeared. Uh, so I got laid off, everybody got laid off, it just was gone. But I was fortunate uh, enough, uh, once again, I was, uh, let's see, I was 60 on uh, May 28, 1990. 
and I had just qualified to retire from GE. So I was, I was gone. I would have been gone anyway. I would have mm -hmm. been laid off. But I thought, well, I can retire. And uh, GE did a good thing for people in my situation. They would supplement your retirement pay until you started to be able to collect Social Security. So I've been retired from GE since. I've been retired since 1993. Okay. But I left GE as a retiree in 90. Okay. And how did you get involved with uh, interviewing veterans? Well, I, I, it, it uh, largely goes back to uh, collecting DIs. And mm -hmm. of course, I was a kid. I, I was 15 years old when World War II ended. But when I was a kid during the war, I always admired the soldiers, the uh, Armed Forces members. You know, I thought, gee, if I was just a little older, I could be part of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, I became part of it five years after <laughs> uh, World War II ended, and I was drafted into the Army, and uh, I was, I wouldn't say I was happy to, to have gone, but I was proud to be a soldier, I was glad to be a soldier. And that's why I stayed in the Reserve when I didn't have to, you know, I could have just taken my retirement, uh, or not retirement, my uh, separation, you know, because they didn't say you're discharged. They would just say you're released from active duty mm -hmm. and assigned, assigned to the reserve. But I didn't have to go to meetings or anything like that. Uh, they never insisted upon that. But I just decided to go into a unit. And uh, so I, I had the 13 years of reserve mm -hmm. time in there. But, uh, but uh, I was always interested in history. and. Uh, uh, one of my avid activities when I was that teenage kid during World War II was reading Life magazine and following all the pictures and the text. And uh, I was always very interested in history and particularly military history. Uh, if you, uh, now you've uh, always collected patches or do you do? Mm -hmm. Both. Yeah, just strictly the, the patches. Yeah. Well, I have um, quite a large number of patches. I got them mostly during World War II. Mm -hmm. And those are uh, more valuable now, you know, because they go back sure. to the original uh, time. And there were a lot more than because the Army was much larger in those days than it was, you know, in recent times. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, I've been interested in those kinds of things for a long time, and I'm interested in other people who are interested in them. That's why I belong to ASME. Okay. And, and how many interviews have you conducted, uh, uh, veterans interviews? Just this one. Just that one? Just this one, yes. Okay. And uh, I've tried to do others, mm -hmm. but uh, so many people say uh, they won't do it. I um, actually, I got involved with this uh, interview uh, through bowling, and uh, I bowl during the winter months with a group of old men, uh, and I'm an old man myself, but uh, 78, that's not old. You're mellow with age. <laughs> I'm in fear, I'm enjoying the conversation. Never old, mellow with age. <laughs> Carry on, sir. Um, well, I, uh, the first time I went to this bowling group, um, I met a number of people who were veterans. This Bill Callahan, if you notice the name there. Um, the first time I bowled there, uh, I said, you know, my name is Jim Rat. And so Bill Callahan said, are you any relation to John Rapp? And I said, yes, he's my cousin. And I mentioned that I'd been in, uh, working in the police department, but not as a law enforcement officer directly because I worked in communications at the radio station. 
Well, I had two cousins um, who were policemen, and um, there was a third child in that family, a, a daughter, a sister, and she was married to a policeman. So there were a lot of uh, contacts with the policemen there. And so this, uh, this Bill Callahan uh, said that he was a police reporter. He had worked for the Courier Express in Buffalo. I don't, if you're not from here, you, mm -hmm. don't, you wouldn't recognize that name. But there used to be two papers. There used to be more than two in Buffalo. There was a New York, uh, the Buffalo Times. There was a Buffalo Evening News, which was around for many years. And there was the Buffalo Courier Express. And he was the police reporter for uh, the uh, Courier Express. So that's how we were introduced. And uh, so um, and he was, of course, the, the belly turret gunner on his B-17. Mm -hmm. And he was over in uh, North Africa in 42, uh, the 12th Air Force. And uh, then uh, I told him I had heard about this program, and that interested me uh, right away. And I said, Bill, would you be interested in being interviewed for this program? And he agreed to do it. And uh, the man who did the video for us uh, was also a World War II veteran, a CB. And, uh, we tried to get them together again. But, for example, there's a, a man who uh, bowls there in that group, and he must be like 81 now, or possibly 82. But he was uh, a Marine on uh, uh, Iwo Jima when he was 17. And I tried to get him to uh, participate, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't do it. And then there's also a man who was there at the time. Uh, he was a colonel in the reserve, and I, I, I knew him to some degree from the reserve. Uh, I was never in a unit that he commanded, but uh, his name was Joe Varga. And he was, uh, he was a principal or assistant principal at Kenmore West High School, where all of my eight children went. And I had seen him around, I had heard him. There was another colonel who was a, a principal at uh, one time there. And I don't know what happened to him, but he just, uh, he may have died. Uh, but uh, Joe Varga is still alive. He's in very good health, or very poor health, is what mm -hmm. I meant to say. Uh, and so is his wife. <clears throat> Uh, so he doesn't come to bowling anymore. But uh, I said, would you uh, allow me to interview you? He went back into 42 in the infantry in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was an infantry officer, and uh, I thought it would, be, it would be great if we could get him to uh, tell his story. Uh, but he wouldn't do it, he said. I don't remember that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's how he ended uh, my pre-interview. <laughs> Kathleen, do you have any questions? I don't have any for you. Okay. Are you doing shorthand or do you do I'm it? I'm doing in... longhand version of okay. your. <laughs> you're, you're doing very well. So I can transcribe. You sir, are you well spoken man? So there's no trouble with him lady. Take the script down. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the also interview. Also, allow me thank to thank you for the pleasure of being able to sit here and listen to your conversation, oh. your lifestyle, and also I'd like to put another compliment. I understood you say that you were a father of eight offsprings. Yes. You planted the seed well. I hope you're taking after the father. Pardon? I hope you're taking after the father. Well, um, our I mean, you taught them the finer and the better things in life. Our children have done uh, well. Uh, of all of our eight children are college graduates. Uh, we have uh, one who is a PhD in geology. He's a research professor. He's been all over the world. Um, 
He's currently at uh, university uh, in Canberra, Australia. He's been in Japan. He's been in Russia. He's been. Do you still have difficulty teaching the uh, kangaroos? <laughs> well, we saw a lot of kangaroos. I, I've been over there. I, I, as I said, I did a lot of traveling with GE. I was, I was in Australia. Excuse me, I'm going to do a copy here of this. Um, on business. Have you visited your son there in Australia? Yes, we did. How many years ago? Oh, let's see, two or three. Two or three, and he's been back a couple of times, and we probably will go again. And then um, he is the second of our five sons. And as I said, all of our uh, children are college graduates, and uh, several of them have advanced degrees. Of course, he's the PhD. And he went to UB here uh, as an undergraduate. And then he went to, uh, he was working around uh, Pittsburgh, Washington, Pennsylvania. And uh, he was going, going part-time to Carnegie Mellon while he was there. And My then, son graduated and there's an architect. Pardon? My son graduated and there's an architect. Oh, well, that's... He's in Pittsburgh now, as a matter of fact, we're going to be an architect. Oh. Well, then, he, uh, he got a, a grant, uh, a research grant at RPI. So he, uh, he got his master's degree and his PhD from RPI, Rensselaer. Mm -hmm. Over in Toronto. Getting back to Australia, though. If you know your history, and I take it you're a historian, you've got to remember one thing, the majority of people in Australia were outcasts from England. Yeah. Convicts. Oh, yes. Right. They were undesirables. Okay. Was there anything else you'd like to add, or? Well, uh, if, talking about the size of the family, we mm -hmm. have uh, 14 grandchildren. We have seven granddaughters and seven grandsons. And we just came back recently from having made a trip to uh, North Carolina because our oldest granddaughter, our oldest grandchild and granddaughter uh, just graduated from medical school at the uh, University of North Carolina. And her brother, um, there's a, another sister between the two of them, but her brother who is the youngest of the three children who are uh, children of my oldest daughter. Uh, he's going to the dental school down there. And my that middle girl graduated uh, as a civil engineer, but then she decided she wants to go. She's now going to pharmacy school. And- uh, It's a big demand for pharmaceutical people. Yeah, and uh, that same week we, we drove down, uh, uh, this girl's name is Katie, Catherine, uh, and we drove down to uh, North Carolina. We've been down there before because now we have one of our our youngest daughter lives down there. But uh, we drove down, um, and uh, Katie graduated on uh, uh, May 11th, which was Mother's Day, and then. The following day, which of course was Monday, we drove back. And uh, we got back here. And that Friday, we flew to Denver because another uh, grandchild, grandson, was graduating from the University of Colorado at Denver. So it was a pretty tiring week for us. What question am I asking? You're so interested in Denver than anything else. What do you know about the honor flight? The what? The honor flight. You do, too, sir. Yeah. Mr. Kalinowski just came back from the honor flight to Washington. Oh, I'm was sorry, that? I won't be sitting in on yours. Was I like you here. That was about taking the World War II oh, veterans to see the honor. I'd be a more secure. Okay, I'm going to cut well, this right now. Thank you, sir. Do you do what you to do.